Hello, dear viewer. This video is all about circular movements. If you have seen my video about multibrots, then what is displayed on the screen right now might seem very familiar. In that video, we discovered that the main body of every multibrot is an epicycloid. An epicycloid is the trace that a dot on the perimeter of a rolling circle makes when this circle is rolling around another static circle. Given the nature of the construction of epicycloids, it is clear that the ratio between the length of the green arrow and the length of the pink arrow implies the ratio of the rotational speed of the two arrows and vice versa. In this video, we will not limit us with this restriction. We will figure out what shapes we can make by combining different amounts of arrows for which we can choose their lengths and their rotational speeds independently from each other. In order to explore what other shapes we can construct by combining circular motions, let us set up the screen first. In the bottom quarter of the screen is our toolbox. Here we can choose which circular motions should be part of our construction. The arrow in the middle doesn't rotate at all while arrows to its right rotate one, two or three times counterclockwise. Arrows to its left rotate up to three times clockwise. For each arrow, we can choose its starting angle and its length. The other portion of our screen is the showcase area, and it displays what shape our chosen arrows create. Let's look at what shape this yellow arrow combined with the green arrow makes. They create a circle whose radius equals the length of the green arrow and whose center is placed at the tip of the non-moving yellow arrow. It's easy to see that with the yellow arrow, we can shift our overall construction wherever we want. So if we want our circle to be somewhere else, we just change the yellow arrow. Let's include the orange arrow. This arrow makes one clockwise rotation. Now the arrows create an ellipse. Let's see what happens when we make the green arrow and the orange arrow equal in length. Let's also change the angle of the orange arrow. Wow, we are able to draw a perfectly straight horizontal line. Now let's see, if we change the angle just right, we might be able to draw a vertical line too. Indeed, we were able to draw a vertical line. The angle of the drawn line seems to be the average of the angles of the orange arrow and the green arrow. Let's test this one last time on an arbitrary angle. So it seems that with circular motions we can draw any straight line. That's pretty cool, don't you think? Of course we can also draw epicycloids. Let's draw a cardioid just for demonstration. I wonder what happens if we use the pink arrow instead of the purple one. 
That way the remaining arrows rotate in different directions. That one is also really nice. It almost looks like a triangle. I have an idea. Let's build with the arrows who only rotate once, a vertical line. And let's build with the arrows who rotate twice, a horizontal line. Let's see what this gets us. Oh, it looks like a standing hourglass. Okay, now I want to go all out. Let's build something with all seven arrows. Oh, well, I'm not gonna lie. This is kinda underwhelming. I'm sure there are some really beautiful shapes out there that can be created with seven arrows, but I have no idea how to adjust the lengths and the angles of the arrows to get one of the beautiful shapes. I think I can help you out on that, but first let me show you what you can create when you don't limit yourself to seven arrows. Oh wow, that's a large number of arrows. Yes indeed. There are 101 arrows to be precise. It is displayed at the top left corner of the screen. Oh, I see. But what does C-50 to C-50 mean? I'll get to that later. But for now it tells us that every arrow in between from rotating clockwise 50 rotations to rotating counterclockwise 50 rotations is included. It's really impressive that such a shape can be drawn by only combining circular motions. But what exactly is this shape? I'm not sure, but legends have it that this is the shape of a very influential being in another universe. Now tell me, how did you figure out how to set up the lengths and the initial angles of all 101 arrows? I'll tell you soon enough, but for that, let us go back to your screen with the seven arrows. Let's describe the curve you created mathematically. We describe it by creating a parameterization of it. Let's call this parameterization F. Let's set the domain of F to the interval from 0 to 1. The function values shall be complex numbers. These can easily be interpreted as points in 2D space. Now let's assign an expression to F of T. The arrows we are rotating can be expressed by complex numbers, where the absolute value R stands for the length of the arrow, and phi stands for its initial angle. The subscripts stand for the amount of rotations the corresponding arrow does. Negative subscripts stand for clockwise rotations, and positive subscripts stand for counterclockwise rotations. Since the subscripts alone won't cause any rotations, we need to multiply the complex values by the following terms to get the rotations we want. Now for better visuals, let's display the complex numbers which stand for the arrows as coefficient c. Combining the movements of the arrows corresponds to adding up all the terms we created so far. At last, we can write them with summation notation. Joseph Fourier showed that if we do not limit ourselves to a finite amount of arrows, 
we can express any curve as an infinite sum of rotating arrows. Now to the question how we get the coefficient c, and thereby the lengths of the arrows and their initial angles. Let's say we have a given parameterization f of a curve. If we wanted to describe this parameterization as circular movements, we need to figure out the coefficient c. To figure out an arbitrary coefficient c, j, we can do the following. First, we start with this equation. Now we multiply the equation by the following term. This term causes every arrow to make j less rotations counterclockwise. So now the arrow which corresponds to c, j, doesn't rotate anymore. We will illustrate that by splitting up the sum at the right side of the equality sign. But let's first integrate both sides from 0 to 1. Now let's split up the sum as mentioned before. Then on the right side we turn the integral into the sum of three integrals. Now we switch up the integral with the sum. In general be careful when doing so with infinite sums. Just bear with me it is okay here. Next we recognize that the first and third integral on the right are zero because their integrands are multiple full turns around circles at the origin. With the integral being zero, their outer sums are also zero. The second integral turns out to be just c, j. So in order to figure out c, j, we just have to compute the integral on the left side of the equal sign. Oh great. Thank you for the explanation. So for every arrow I want to include, I need to compute its corresponding coefficient c, j, by computing the integral, which is now to the right side of the equality sign. And the more arrows I include, the closer will my curve created by circular movements approximate the curve given by the parameterization f. The fact that different arrows accomplish different amounts of full rotations in the same time means that they are rotating at different frequencies. The length of an arrow with a particular frequency tells us how much of that frequency is present in the curve. This process of determining which frequencies are present in a given curve or signal is called the Fourier transformation. Since you mentioned approximating a given curve with finitely many arrows, I can show you that in action on our mysterious being. Thank you for watching this video till the end. If you liked the video, please give it a like. And if you want to see more videos like this, then consider subscribing to this channel. Let me know in the comments if there is anything you want to see next.